subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. The print of the cuff presented by IIFL Wealth and Asset Management, corporate partner AU Small Finance Bank in association with Global Insurance Brokers, airline partner SpiceJet, associate partner TDI Infratech. Welcome to this session of Off the Cuff and our guest today is a star, a risen star, not a rising star, in a very difficult universe, the universe of epidemiology. Professor Devi Sridhar, University of Edinburgh Medical School, uh, a top epidemiologist at a very early age, if I may say so, uh, and somebody who speaks the truth and speaks the hard truth, because I follow her on Twitter, I, I read her interview in Lancet, uh, I've read her other writings, and we all know her track record. Uh, so, Devi, if I may call you that, uh, welcome to Off the Cuff. And there is something in your Lancet interview that sticks to my mind. You say that, forget about going, going back to 2019, in terms of going back to the normal. So what will be the normal now, if not 2019? Well, I think if we look at every single country in this world are having to grapple with this virus and introduce restrictions or have trade-offs. So we can either grieve for the world we've lost and all the kind of freedoms we had and the way we lived our life, or we can look to the future and say, how do we shape the future post-COVID to be more equitable, more fair, more focused on public health? Um, what is our new society going to look like? And so I think if we can look forward, it's more, let's say, um, positive rather than always looking backwards. Because if we're looking backwards, it won't get us anywhere right now. The argument will be we'll get a vaccine in the. So we'll be back to normal. Well, not really. So a vaccine will help us get to normal alongside testing and alongside better treatments, but it's all part of your strategy. So I was fascinated to talk to people in Australia who say a vaccine will help them with elimination. And this is how it may be used in East Asia to actually just get rid of the virus by ring vaccination, where you eliminate anyone, you vaccinate anyone who's been exposed to the virus. In the UK, they're talking about the vaccine, just vaccinating the vulnerable and the elderly and letting the young acquire the vaccine, acquiring the virus normally. So I think a vaccine will help for a strategy, but it's not the silver bullet or the fairy tale ending of this pandemic. It's just an additional tool. And I think we need to be realistic with people of what a vaccine can and cannot do. What is it that the vaccine cannot do? Well, a vaccine, for example, we're not going to have enough doses to vaccinate everyone on the planet. So it's not going to be like we can just vaccinate everyone and we go back to normal life. It's going to have to be used as a strategy. So is the vaccine going to be used to prevent deaths? But then you accept that younger people have to get the, the virus and have to you know, live with it. Is your strategy to help this with suppression, to break chains of transmission? So you use the vaccine to go after super spreaders, those who are in healthcare workers, social care workers, people in security, people who are basically exposed a lot to the virus. Or is your vaccine going to use for elimination? You say actually similar to, um, you know, Ebola, we don't want to live with it. So you can see different vaccination strategies you have for measles, for example, we vaccinate, you know, the 80% who are healthy to protect the 20% who can't take the vaccine. For flu, we vaccinate the most vulnerable to prevent deaths. Um, and for in a disease like Ebola, we vaccinate to eliminate it. So a vaccine can be used for different ways and for different strategies. And that's kind of the discussions we need to be having with different countries, which is how will we use a vaccine? And that'll depend who you actually give it to. So is there a strategy that you would suggest for a country like India? Well, I think it comes back to what is what is what would be the most effective way. So what struck me looking at India is about half the deaths have been in people under the age of 60, which means even if you vaccinated everyone over the age of 65, you wouldn't prevent many of the deaths if you let the virus go through the young, meaning the people under 60. So actually, probably in India, you'd first want to use it as a strategy of suppression. So you go after those who seem to be most likely to be exposed to the virus, essential workers, you know, those who are out every day. And then from that, you know, try to work out to um, to actually trying to suppress the virus at a larger scale. I think just adopting a flu strategy is very hard with this virus because it's not like it only kills people over the age of 70 or 75. It actually can kill young people too, especially if they have other health issues. And so I think for a country like India, probably for suppression is the right way to go. Yeah, but 
the other side of uh, these figures is that only only less than 10%, I think 8% of Indians are above the age of 60. So that demographic is also important. So 8% of Indians account for 57% of the deaths. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think the thing that you see most stark with this virus is age is probably the overriding factor in terms of mortality. But I think, um, you know, in public health, we want to prevent all deaths. We want to prevent all illness. And so you'd start, obviously, with those who are most likely and to die and be exposed. But you also want to prevent illness in younger people. And there are younger people getting very ill from this virus, too. I see the debate and I see your interventions in it. Uh, and that comes up when people say herd immunity, let the young go out and get infected uh, and protect. So basically, people at, of your age should go out and get infected. And people of my age should be hidden wrapped in cotton wool and protected. And I know that you have sharp views on it. Will you, will you well, elaborate? Well, it's not just me. I mean, if you look, the WHO director general has called this, you know, um, immoral, unscientific. You know, Dr. Fauci in the United States, a long time, you know, infectious disease physician has called it immoral and pseudoscience. Um, numerous infectious disease societies have come out saying this is not a strategy. We have never used herd immunity as a strategy to any infectious disease in the past. We've never said to whether it's cholera or plague or malaria or TB, oh, we'll just let people get it and at some point it'll stop. Like this is bordering on just, you know, something that can be run in a computer simulation or sounds great in theory, but we've never actually implemented it. And to take such a risk with people's lives and the economies, because what people don't seem to realize is they seem to think either we take COVID deaths or we have our normal life. And for all those deaths, we can continue with normal life. But that's not how it plays out. What you're seeing is uncontrolled transmission is actually the worst thing for your economy because people get scared, their behavior changes. Your health services, we're seeing this now in Europe. I mean, the beds start filling up in hospitals. And so all of a sudden you're forced into lockdowns and restrictions because this virus leads to such high rates of hospitalization. And so in a way, you know, my take on that is this herd immunity strategy is going to lead to a lot of deaths, economic pain, as well as health services being overrun, so more lockdowns. And so though they might couch it as this is the way to avoid lockdowns, if we see how it's played out for the past nine months, that is the path to lockdowns, because we know uncontrolled transmission of this virus will decimate health services and force governments to have to stop social contact in a very draconian way. Yeah, because you can get more beds, but you only have that many health workers. They'll fall sick and they'll get tired. Exactly. And we've seen that in the United States. CDC released a study yesterday. I was looking at astonishing about a quarter of healthcare workers acquired COVID of them. You know, how many were having severe symptoms, possibly because of the high viral load that they're getting in hospitals. You know, quite a lot of health workers have died in the UK um, because they didn't have adequate PPE when they were working. They didn't have the masks and the gowns. Um, So I feel like, you know, the analogy I use is like in football, your health services are your goalie. You're not just going to leave your goalie on the pitch and let, you know, tons of, you know, footballs go flying past them. You have different lines of defense. And so you have to build your public health system. So you take the burden off your health services. Health services are your last line of defense. You really should be trying to get stop people getting infected in the first place. You are a good teacher. I can see that. (laughs) (laughs) So we also have epidemiologists in India who've been brought up sort of in the hard Indian environment of epidemics and poverty, who tend to say that the only way is let the young go out, very few of them will die, protect the old. And in fact, one of them was, who's the most aggressive backer of this, he was asked that what about these young coming back home because their parents are older than them. And he said, tell your old man to sleep under the mango tree. Uh, okay. I mean, is that science? No, I mean, so there are different debates to be had. So we can debate, for example, um, what is the appropriate strategy? What is proportional and different kinds of harms? I think that's completely scientific. I think what's not scientific is thinking that you can shield a certain group of the population, cocoon them, and so they're not exposed to the risk. There is... It's just never been done. It's not practical. We're seeing it in Europe, Sweden, the Netherlands, and the UK through everything at care homes. Care homes are the most vulnerable group you can have and probably one of the most easiest to isolate because they're in an institution. Even so, virus virus is getting into those care homes, even with regular testing, and it's killing many people off who are living there. So even if you can't shield people in care homes, how do you shield them in society and households? Um, It's also immoral. What kind of society is it to just shield and make older people hide away forever? 
Because this idea of herd immunity says, in theory, that over a certain amount of time, you'd build up enough immunity so people could reemerge. But actually, we don't even know if you can build immunity. You know, we're seeing in the UK an antibody study out, out today saying antibodies weighed after 12 weeks. Does this mean immunity goes? We're seeing reinfections, not very many, but a few, which is worrying because you'd expect not to see any so far if immunity was completely protective. And we never developed herd immunity to measles. Measles offers lifelong protection for your whole life. And we never developed that until we had a vaccine. All we got was epidemic cycles. And so I think what you are saying, if you take that approach, is that we're going to have uncontrolled spread. People are going to hide. Some of those people are going to die, probably the poorest, because they're less able to shield. And we're going to have waves of this virus. It's going to hit our health services repeatedly. And I think also what we're finding um, and there's a new study out of Australia yesterday is younger people can also develop some kind of autoimmune condition. So they survive, but they live with big quality. They can't work. They have recurring fevers. They have heart issues. They have brain issues. So this virus is not like, oh, you get the flu and you survive it and you continue life. This actually can lead to severe debilitation, even for young and healthy people. So I get that it sounds attractive. It's an easy solution to say, just let the young get it. But actually, if you work it out month by month for a year, a year and a half, you see it's actually completely unacceptable, which is why no country that I know of has adopted this as their strategy. That No country has said herd immunity is our strategy. Even the UK government has come out and said, actually, we're not going to pursue it for these reasons. I think Sweden went closest to this, isn't it? Yeah. So if you look back at Sweden and one of their kind of advisors wrote a piece in The Lancet um, about their approach, and he said every country is going to take the same number of deaths. Um, over time. So why destroy your economy and society for it? Just get the deaths over with. All that's going to matter is your health service capacity. So build more hospitals and just, you know, get ready for it to go through. But Sweden has also changed. If you look now at their approach, like today, for example, Uppsala, a town in Sweden, have got into kind of a light lockdown. So they've told their population, avoid public transport, don't meet other households, numbers are increasing, you know, work from home, don't go to crowded places, and they're trying to see, can we just advise people what to do? So not legislate it, not shut down the economy, but just advise people and will people shift their behavior? So they're trying to go for a strategy where they trust their population, that if they just tell them, you know, don't do that, that people will do it. Um, we've tried that in the UK and what we find is the opposite. So you say to people on Monday, you know, bars are closing and on Sunday there's a huge party in the street and everyone says it's our last night to party. Let's, you know, celebrate. You say to people, a quarantine's coming in. And what does everyone do? They rush to get back an hour before quarantine. So they don't have to quarantine. So we've kind of have, I don't know what the right approach is, but actually some populations and some governments have the trust that voluntary can work and others have to take harsher measures. But I don't think Sweden is just letting the virus run. They've taken a lot of deaths, right. especially in their elderly things. And I think they're trying to avoid repeating that. So you think they regret what they did earlier? Personally, I think so. But I don't think they'll ever say that because political leadership can never come out because I think, you know, Sweden was always seen like the United States and global health as one of the most enlightened. Absolutely, yes. Scandinavian countries were leading the way. And if you look at the contrast between Sweden and Norway and Finland, Norway and Finland went the, you know, the enlightened path of early lockdowns, keeping the numbers low, got their economic recovery. Sweden has kind of gone down, you know, a bit of a darker path. And I don't think they would ever admit that ever. So I don't think they can ever come out and say it. But if you look at what's shifted and what they're doing, it's actually quite different. Um, and who would have thought Sweden would become kind of the poster child for the Donald Trump administration and for kind of right wing politicians? It's quite an interesting moment for them as well. Of What are they representing now on the world stage? Yeah. So uh, and they've taken a hit to the economy as well. Yes, I think this is what is astonishing is that at the start, there was the idea you could delay the economic impact by, you know, not having restrictions, where the FT has done great analysis showing that, you know, Norway, Finland and Sweden all took about the same economic hit. Sweden's deaths per capita are much, much higher. Much so the economic pain comes. It's if you take the deaths as well. And actually the places winning with their economies and their health are East Asian countries. South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Australia, and the Pacific, New Zealand, who are kind of following the East Asian model. They're even like Taiwan is seeing an increase in its GDP. Astonishing. And you're thinking how? And it's because they dealt with their public health problem, then they dealt with their economic problem, and then they figured out how to get international travel going and forming these travel bubbles, which are quite fascinating in terms of like, you know, you get COVID free and so you have similar prevalence and you can have, allow travel without actually friction between those places. You were born and brought up in America, we know, uh, but you spent time in India, particularly for your malnutrition research, which is really landmark stuff. Uh, 
were you ever did you ever become familiar with the indian folk tale of the village idiot who was caught stealing onions no you can tell me <laughs> and he was then given the option of either having a 100 shoe beatings or eating a 100 onions so first he said i'll eat onions that will be easier so he ate about 10 he said i can't handle it i'll have the shoes <laughs> then he had about two of 10 of those and i can't do it i'll go back to onions so sweden reminds you of a little bit of that yeah i think so i think but not just sweden i think many european countries is that they're kind of caught between their economies and their health and then exactly that they're kind of losing it both instead of choosing their strategy um i mean i think also it's interesting that many of the modelers and the infectious disease community says this virus is uncontrollable it's uncontrollable um so it's interesting that that east asian scientists think it is controllable and so you also and you know the countries who think it's controllable have controlled it the countries who said we could never control this even as back as january and february there was articles written by scientists saying everyone is going to get this and those countries everyone you know everyone's getting it but it's been harder to check it so in a way it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy if you thought it could be controlled your government controlled it if you thought you could manage it like sars you managed it like sars if you thought this was like flu it's been managed like flu in a way those kind of choices and mindset dictated how it's actually played out so what does this scientist believe well i am very influenced because i've been following this from january by the east asian model i'm just in awe of these governments because of the logistics the data science the commitment to their populations um how advanced they've been in their planning i mean even japan i mean they never did a lockdown they've you know taken a hit but they've given good advice around face masks around avoiding crowded places i personally lean to the east asian model because i say there is a path through this which avoids a lot of death economic damage and keeps your society running. So why wouldn't you take that path? I don't understand it. And I don't know whether it's in the west whether it's lack of humility. And we're so used in for example in Britain or America to telling the world what to do because we are seen as the leaders especially in pandemic preparedness. The UK and US were always ranked the highest. So we're used to going into countries and saying, you know, Senegal, you need to do this and South Africa this or India that. And for once I wonder actually if we had been better off if you know we had had experts from other countries like Senegal, you know, India, you know Malaysia you know different countries coming in and saying actually this is what you need to be doing and South Korea saying this is how you need to fix your test and trace sometimes you need someone outsider to come in to show you actually what are the failings in your system and how can you do better and unfortunately we're just not yet at that point here line i use often is that this is a virus with a mega ego and if anybody confronts it with his ego this virus punishes you and punishes your population in the process I think that's absolutely right. I think that's correct. You've seen Bolsonaro, Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, uh this virus is vindictive. Yeah, and it's very deceptive and I think this is also why because you know we underestimate it repeatedly. And every time it's underestimated as you're exactly saying, you get punished badly for underestimating it. So in some way, the countries that immediately treated it like a SARS event, you know, we cannot let the spread have done better because they chose their path. whereas the ones who have said sometimes it's so bad we need to lock down but sometimes it's not so bad we can let it spread we've ended up going in circles discussing that how bad is it really and in that time the virus keeps spreading our hospitalizations increase and we go back into lockdown while we're still discussing is it really serious so i think you're right on that uh, that point yeah i'm interested in something that you said in passing uh, in one of your earlier answers today you said a uh, viral load when we talk we were talking about health workers and doctors is there enough science to tell us that how much virus you are exposed to also determines the seriousness of your sickness so i haven't seen anything conclusive i've seen in several preprints but there's so many scientific preprints so it's hard to assess the quality and the hint is that they've been looking at face coverings and saying perhaps face coverings help because even if people get infected the viral load is much less and they might help reduce the severity so there've been kind of hypotheses suggestions but nothing conclusive that i've seen but you think there is a uh, there is some there is something to back the hypo- hypothesis i don't know actually i mean i i don't i wouldn't want to put my you know what is it my flag on either one i really don't know about that it's a hypothesis that has to be explored it's one of the hypotheses that's been given for why younger health workers who are healthy have died i mean why do we have you know 30 year old health workers dying in the states as well i mean it makes no sense unless you say okay could they have been exposed in a hospital to repeated doses of this or to a high load of it 
That's what Dr. Siddharth Mukherjee said in his long article for New Yorker some time back. And I think he was the example of this Chinese, young Chinese doctor uh, who died with Exactly, exactly. And I think this also gets back to why, you know, when, when we have anti-mask demonstrations, when we discuss how serious is it, when we say, I'll let it go through, the people picking up the pieces are the doctors and the nurses and the midwives and the cleaners in hospital. They are the ones who have to deal with those decisions because they don't get to choose whoever comes in, am I going to treat them or not? They have to treat whoever comes. And the more pressure you have, because more people are coming in, then it's harder to be able to kind of maintain those standards of safety because you're so overwhelmed by how many patients. So I think that's when you start seeing um, health workers becoming infected because they're not actually able to take their time to have the appropriate safety gear and the time to be able to treat patients cautiously. Well, I'll take some questions also from my colleagues and guests. So Sandhya Ramesh, who's our science editor, uh, and she follows you very closely. <laughs> and, and she says, you've been urging people to get outside with nature. Now, if you do that, what if people don't wear masks? If you, and if people don't wear masks, how much distance is safe distance? So it depends where you're going outside. So if you're going to obviously a crowded marketplace, then wearing a mask is a necessity. If you're within, I would say, one to two meters of someone. If you're going out and in Scotland, we're lucky we have large empty spaces with just sheep and goats and some cows, then actually you don't probably need a face covering if you're with your family and your household who you're anyway at home with. So I think it's a judgment. How close are you to other people? Are you going to a crowded marketplace? Are you going to, you know, someplace where you're going to be in close contact with others, a bus station, or are you actually going to the middle of a park or, you know, a wilderness? So I've just been trying to tell people all the things they can do rather than all the things they can't do. And our second question, long COVID. First of all, uh, how frequent is that? Uh, how prolific is that? And how troublesome is that? So on how the prevalence, this is a big matter of debate because in the UK, they didn't test anyone in March at all for this virus, only if you were admitted to hospital. So many people suffered at home and they suffered for months, but they never know if they had COVID or not. And you can give an antibody test, but the antibody tests aren't very reliable and antibodies fade. So a colleague of mine, um, for example, she knows she had COVID. She was in hospital. She took an antibody test 12 weeks later. It was positive. She took one 15 weeks later. It was negative. So if she had just had the antibody test at the end at 15 weeks, she would have think she never had COVID. It's only because she had the previous markers. So the prevalence is a really tricky one. I think, you know, some studies are starting to come out and they estimate it. I think some of the lower estimates are around 2%. Some of the higher estimates are a third. So yeah. that's kind of the range. Um, at a population level, even 1% would be a lot, especially in that age range, 30 to 60, which it seems to hit. How worrisome is it? I think it's incredibly worrying because these are young and healthy people. And even if we take away quality of life from an economic perspective, that means that those people won't be able to work. They'll be on sick leave. They won't be able to earn. They're also needing rehabilitation from health services. So here we have a public funded health service. So the NHS is trying to set up rehabilitation centers, physio. That's a huge cost. You're having young people who would have long lives being healthy, not in your health service, suddenly needing care and support. So I think, you know, looking at Sweden, we changed, we talked about its change. I think one of the things that must have hit them is about 180,000 Swedish people came forward with long COVID. That's going to, in some way, the people who survive are harder for your system than the people who die. Because the people who die don't keep straining resources. So from a purely, it sounds terrible, but from a purely economic perspective, you don't want young people getting sick especially if they live a long time, but they live unhealthily because it's a drain on your system. And I think that's why long COVID is quite worrying to leaders because of that angle of it. For me, it's worrisome because you don't want young people having decades of suffering. Why would someone who's healthy and young have decades of that? And even still, why would you have someone who's 30 and asthmatic die and people say they would have died anyways? No, people who are as with asthma live for decades. Their life wouldn't have been any shorter unless they had, had COVID. Yeah, and then countries like India, for example, who have a lot of young people, so you could get you could get focused on the wrong demographic, protecting the old, while this spreads through your young. And you have yeah, this, I think that's completely right. That's why I mean I have called this approach a bit disrespectful to the young because you expect the young to be part of the herd. So the young are happy to be part of the herd if it's a measles vaccine because we know this vaccine is safe. So fine, we'll be part of the herd. But to ask young people to risk their health to say you're part of the herd. It's a big ask, especially for young people who then might have to live with decades of disability. For someone living in Scotland, I think the only people who can be part of a herd is 
sheep and cow <laughs> <laughs> not human beings so uh, i have a question from our abantika ghosh who heads our covid team uh, and she says you've been critical of uh, opening up uh, opening up plans but prolonged lockdown also has its consequences because it affects people not just the economy but people with other sicknesses also suffer so how do you find that balance so i think actually though it's some way a false balance because what we're seeing is that if you have too many covid patients your health services can't run for anything else we're already seeing this now in europe where they're stopping non essential surgeries they're delaying appointments because your doctors are too occupied taking care of covid patients who are dying in front of you or need oxygen in front of you rather than worrying about the person who needs chemotherapy in 3 months so the best way to save your health services is to keep your numbers low then the question becomes how do you keep your numbers low and actually lockdowns are a very crude way to do it you're locking everybody down the social and economic costs are massive so that's where you're testing and i think i've been a huge advocate of testing cuz i think it's one of the few tools we have to say is someone infectious and if they are infectious let's get them out of the pool so they're not infecting others and try to break those chains of transmission so i think you know repeated lockdowns is not the way um and i one of my last guardian articles was called that continuous lockdowns are not the way because the costs are so high but there are other ways and countries are finding them through building up massive diagnostics this is one of the ways germany and europe has been able to keep its numbers low it just runs mass testing so if you come into hospital you're tested if you arrive in the country you're tested if you want to go to the nearest train station you get tested and it's free and yes the costs are high of testing but the costs of locking down are much higher well even a country like india is now is now closing in on 110 million tests that's 11 crore as we say in india it's a lot of tests for a poor country like india Remar so, it's remarkable actually how much testing has been built up in this time so there is a virologist a famous headline virologist in switzerland vida stegler who says that everybody who test is not infectious and you're wasting your time you're picking up the dead virus it's a you've read this stuff what's your view on that well yeah the test isn't perfect we know that right and it has its problems and hopefully we can get to a better test but it's a test we have and it's one of the few tools we have so i guess for me it's more about harm mitigation which is that how do we we could have a perfect world and a perfect test and a perfect quarantine system or we can live in the world we have which is that how do we mitigate against those harms and testing is one of them yes we're going to catch people who have you know who test for several weeks because of viral particles but is that better than not testing at all we've already seen the countries who test are doing better um and again if people test positive and have to go into quarantine um we can also modify what we ask of them so if they're working are they able to work from home we could say to them and you know you can still go outside but don't see anyone outside so go to a park stay keep your distance so tell them what they can and can't do i think in some way just telling people to stay home for 14 days it hasn't worked in europe really because people just don't want to stay home 14 days um they don't have the financial support they don't have the emotional support so how do we start to kind of modify it so that we break chains of transmission but in a way that's more realistic to our life so your one of uh, ebola virus outbreak uh, that's been your landmark work uh in fact i wrote i would note to i would underline to that and your work on malnutrition in india uh which made you spend several months in india now your evaluation of 2014 ebola virus outbreak uh, this is my colleague mohana basu from our science bureau who asks uh that culminated in some recommendations for the future pandemic preparedness looking at how we responded to corona virus now do you think we repeated some of the same mistakes or do you think we applied some of those lessons and benefited from that So I think we've learned lessons on the positive side. So I think West African countries responded really well. So what they did is they took their post Ebola recovery structures and made them COVID response structures. And because they had all the infrastructure in place for how they responded to other infectious diseases, they just layered COVID on top. So I think West Africa learned its lessons. The main lesson for WHO was to be more agile, to communicate clearly, to respond faster. I think they did that. You know, they rang the alarm bell 30th of January. They said this is a huge crisis. and at that point it's up to countries i think at you know who can advise countries they can suggest things they can tell them you need to get ready but countries either prepare or they don't prepare that's what you saw so i think they did a good job and they we also asked with ebola there was a lot of kind of fighting between scientists you know trying to go for publication competition and i think we've moved past that if anything we've had too much share 
everything now. And so you have too many preprints because everyone's sharing their pet idea and they're putting it online. So I think there's lots of positives that have come out. I don't think the lessons from Ebola reached though richer countries. I think the United States has actually probably responded much more, responded much more poorly to, e to Ebola, partly because of the leadership in charge and not acknowledging the problem that COVID is. But Western countries as well. I remember in February talking to a friend and I was saying to her, do West like do Western countries understand what's going to happen here? Because we know what happened in Wuhan. They went into lockdown. They built a hospital in a week. You know, do they realize what it's going to hit? And she said, oh, it can't be that bad. You know, we have a flu outbreak every year. And I was like, this isn't the flu. So I think there's been like this kind of apathy or, you know, lack of humility in the face of infectious diseases, which is we did not in Europe learn lessons of Ebola because we never experienced an Ebola outbreak here. Um, everything we're going through here is what West Africa has gone through several years ago. And we read this story, long story in FT a couple of days back that talked about how Africa has actually handled it much better because they have the Ebola experience and they have a lot of virologists and they woke up in time. So Africa actually broke the stereotype. Oh, definitely. I think Africa has done remarkably well, as well as like countries like Southeast Asia. I mean, I mean, even within India, you have different states who are managing remarkably well. I think, you know, this idea, the, the crazy thing, though, in the UK is all the excuses being made. They're like, oh, Vietnam did better because they have lots of bats. And, you know, Hong Kong did better because they, you know, SARS has circulated through their whole population already. And the Pacific did better because they're remote. And Africa did better because they're remote. I'm like, no, that's not. If you look actually at the policy measures they did, they really were on their front foot. I mean, Africa's CDC was briefing health ministers in January. I remember reading those briefings about this is the virus. This is the strain on your health system. This is your oxygen need. This is your ventilation need. And if you saw that, you would say there's no way that they knew that they could treat their way through this. So they immediately implemented their travel bans. They put in place restrictions. They got their populations. And they know it because Ebola shut down schools. It shut down vaccination campaigns, killed many people. So they know it's no joke. And so I think here, when you would say to people, even I remember two weeks before we went into lockdown in the UK, I did an interview and I said, you know, we might be facing school closure. I had three heads. They were like, what? Because they'd never experienced this. Right. And I said, we're going to have to go into severe restrictions. When Italy went into it, people said, never. Then UK, now the interesting thing is we went through a first lockdown and people said, never again will we lock down. And what you're going to see across Europe is a second lockdown. Because you might say never again, but with the virus that causes these hospitalization rates, never again becomes, well, what do we do? We have a virus circulating. We have to actually respond. So one, one line that stands out in this FT article is, I think it's about Sudan, one African country, I think Sudan, says when it started, it had fewer ventilators than it had vice presidents. <laughs> I can believe it, but they knew it. I think they knew they could not treat their way through this. You could not right. build enough hospitals in the time you needed. So and the I only can... way was to build your lines of defense yeah. so that yeah. no footballs were put onto the pitch at all to get through to your goal because your health service was so weak. Yeah. So in fact, the example I've used about Europe now is the double humped Bactrian camel. Now they are going to their second hump. And that's where you think India is now getting off its first hump? Yeah. I mean, this is a really hard one because, as I said, we're probably going to see this. This is what the infectious disease modelers already showed. They showed these multiple humps for years, right, of in and out of restrictions. Um, and ironically, the more fatigue sets in among people to, you know, their behavior to change, the more we're going to see those humps because the numbers are going to increase and then people are going to get scared. We're going to have restrictions and they come down. So unfortunately, this is how it's going to be until you have a vaccine or you have a really effective treatment to keep people out of hospital. Well, I recorded an interview with Mike Pompeo earlier this afternoon because he was visiting India and it, he was without his mask and he said he doesn't mind if I take mine off also. So. Well, how many late days? Give ten, what, nine days to the election, eight days? We'll see. It could be a whole new world in nine days. I'll, I'll just leave that there. <laughs> yes. So, Indian model. Uh, you mentioned India earlier on in this conversation. What is it? What is a good takeaway from what India has done? And what is a bad takeaway from what India has done? Well, I think what has been good is actually trying to be proactive. I think India tried to respond much earlier than European countries and understood the severity. Um, I think the testing and the tracing, they made a big effort to try to get that up and running. 
um, to try to do it locally. And I think you see, of course, differences in states. Um, I think what probably was quite a difficult decision was the lockdowns and the economic harm done through lockdowns. And especially, I think, in at least here, we saw the images of you know migrant workers walking for hours, days, because there was no work for them anymore. So I think you know the lesson I think from India is that um, lockdowns are really a last resort, and if people have the choice, and, and it's the same choice in the UK to be fair that we're seeing as financial support withdraws. If your choice is between feeding your family or between getting COVID, you're probably going to choose getting COVID because do you see what I mean? It's it's um, it's you can't force people to choose between their economic life and their health because they'll choose economic life because they want to support their families. Right. So I think that's the big lesson, which is how do we make sure people never have to make those decisions between their families and between eating and between getting an infectious disease. So fatality rates, that's an issue that comes up, not just in India, but Indian subcontinent uh, and also Southeast Asia in general. Fatality rates are much lower. Now, initial thing was deaths are not being counted. So I can understand infection fatality rate being understated, but case fatality, fatality rate, once people are diagnosed, it's tough to hide. Do you agree that in Asian countries, fatality rates are lower, also in Africa, and if so, why? Yeah, I actually do think they're lower. Um, and I think the reason they're lower is because Generally, people have, are, I mean, it's a younger, healthier population overall. But I think also that people got treatment much earlier. Here uh, in Western countries, people were asked, and think of Italy, Spain, the UK, were asked to stay home until you were really ill. And what you found is people going into hospital at quite a late stage or even dying at home because they just were didn't want to go in to get health care. So I think the real lesson is one, that you have to take care of your population health from a start. Um, because we know the risks of being overweight, of obesity with this virus, but also that you need to get people access to hospital care early on, as P Donald Trump had and as Boris Johnson also got access to. So vaccine nationalism, how will that affect a country like India? Yeah, this is really worrying, this vaccine nationalism, because what you don't want to have is someone develops a vaccine and then hoards all the doses and doesn't manufacture it for anyone else. And we're already seeing the UK trying to make deals to acquire doses of a whole portfolio. You know, the US, you know, they're pushing for this. Um, and so the WHO was trying, the World Health Organization is trying to reach these prearranged deals because it's easier to make a deal before we have a vaccine, everyone can agree to, than after. Right. But it is worrisome because we've seen in the past that there's always a scramble for research, new research products, and it usually goes to the countries that can pay the most. Yeah. Uh, and efficacy of vaccines, WHO says 50% is okay. What? Which vaccine is a vaccine? This is a really tricky one because there's such pressure to have a vaccine. The question is, what does a vaccine actually do? And WHO has put that bar there. I don't think we'll have a perfect vaccine. I think we'll have multiple vaccines. There are 11 in phase three. So I think at the, each stage, it's going to be assessing each one. And it may not be the one that's fastest. It might be the one that takes a bit longer, that's more effective, that ends up winning out. But I think right now, I mean, there are 11 different candidates. So I'm really hopeful that one of the 11, given that they have passed phase one and phase two trials, will come through in phase three. And then it'll be an issue of who do you actually vaccinate first? Towards what strategy? How do you manufacture enough doses? How do you make sure all parts of the world get it? You don't just prioritize certain populations. Um, so those are going to be the pricing, who pays for them. Those are all going to be the next stage of questions. So if a vaccine is available to you and me, me at 63, you at exactly, just reverse <laughs> the number 36, right? Should you or I have that vaccine now or wait for a few months to see how it works? Well, I guess the first question would be actually, do we need it the most or can we already wait? Because I'm not an essential worker. I'm not working in a hospital. So in a sense, I'm quite fortunate that I can work from home and limit my social contacts. And so my first question would be, who needs it the most? Who's most likely to be exposed? Um, if we're most likely to be exposed, then yeah, then I would say trial it. Of course, I'd want to see the studies. I think I was quite worried when President Trump was pushing through you know, the FDA to get something approved. <laughs> so um, no, I'm not in a rush to quickly get a vaccine and take it myself. I'd want to see the full study results and make sure phase three is completed fully and that we get the full scientific, you know, approval for it through proper channels rather than rush something um, through that hasn't been actually through all the safe, safety checks. And what, what should somebody 
at my age living in india be doing get it as soon as you have access to it or wait i think first see which vaccine it is and what the studies say and what the phase 3 trials say i know there you know there's a russian vaccine and a chinese vaccine being used without approvals i'm more nervous about them i would want to see actually all there's a reason we have these phases putin gave it to his daughter yeah and that makes me uncomfortable as a scientist because i think we need to do the safety checks but i think if it goes through phase 3 trials and we have you know a robust publication it's peer reviewed you know you have you know scientists across the world saying the study results are credible then i think it's fine yeah i think at that stage i would feel quite comfortable with the vaccine um but i think before that i would be quite nervous to take something experimental without the appropriate you know checks being done are you are you sometimes worried as a scientist about all these papers coming out now all these non peer reviewed papers and they come and they disappear now they've been about 30 40000 of them since the pandemic began Yeah, I mean as I said it's the flip side, right? So we had in the past too much competition and now we have too much sharing in a way. Um it is worrisome because a lot of the preprints are not very good science. Right. Um it's just I mean the worst of them are these regression or modeling studies where you take a data set here, you take a data set here and then you mix it and then you say this causes this, which you just can't do from those data sets. Um so there has been and then of course in the newspapers pick it up and they run headlines with it because it makes interesting stories. So it has been a real problem. So I've now shifted where I won't for example share a preprint unless I've evaluated it so I've read it and then since done peer review because it's my area of work or if it's not my area of work I'll probably wait or I'll ask a colleague who's in that area of work if there's a new immunology study I'm not an immunologist I'll ask a colleague and say do you think this is robust and wait for them to tell me because I think I want I don't also want to contribute to misinformation by sharing things that aren't scientifically credible um so it's both it has good and bad sides it's good to have scientific community flourishing and lots of information the, the flip side is it's actually hard to decipher what is good science and what is poor science so which brings me to a question closer to your science which is a question of mathematical modeling so people rise uh, so many million will die so many million will not die so many million will get it so in india so many tens of million will get it or not get it now this uh, latest is a study that department of science and technology has got done in india it's a mathematical modeling study which says that if you follow all precautions and by february this will be gone there will be 20000 cases in india uh, but if you don't take precautions with festivals coming in in november you will have the second peak uh, which may be which which may leave you with active cases thrice as many as the previous peak previous peak was a million next one could be almost 3 million how seriously do you take this mathematical modeling studies well i do take them seriously because it's useful insights these are but we have to assess what they are and they aren't they aren't fortune telling they aren't the future they are right. scenarios based on assumptions right. so all they are is a model for a certain you know you enter parameters and then it kicks out what could the future look like so i find it useful as scaffolding to understand when you're planning scenarios different futures we could have but is it the word of god is it you know we can say in 3 months it's going to predict our life no it's it's a it's a mathematical guess prediction for the future of different scenarios it's scenario planning um so i find it useful but it's obviously not the be all end all of the only thing we should base decisions on but so far have you found have you found more of these go wrong because they been models and models and models beginning february uh or some have come closer to accuracy um i mean it's what it's it's the old joke right you can find every model to back up whatever you want to say right you just build your model around what you want and i think that's very true so donald trump the president you know took a model he saw six different models the one that said you'd have the least death he said i that's my favorite model and he took that one right um i think models i mean they have but, they're not perfect. So in the UK for example, they modeled health service capacity. What they missed to put in was doctors and nurses. They looked at number of beds. How many beds we have in the hospital. They didn't anticipate that many healthcare workers would be out of not be able to work because they were sick with covid. So your model falls apart at that point because you modeled something that isn't realistic to real life. Um they also modeled care homes, but they forgot to model that people who work in care homes work in many different care homes. They go between them. So it's not like each care home is a bubble. you have people who will go between them because a lot of them are on very you know poorly paid contracts so they work four or five different contracts to try to make enough income 
So yeah, so I think with models, I mean, I see them, I am interested to read them, I look at the assumptions, um, but they're just one input. I mean, I also would go in, I think one of the mistakes, for example, with health service capacities, if you talk to any doctor in an ICU or someone who runs a hospital, their biggest worry was having enough staff, not having enough bed. The beds wasn't the issue, was the staff. So you have to kind of cross check it with, you know, other sources of data. So the question was actually from my very young colleague, Sonia Agrawal. I should not okay. be for it. And I have Himani Chandna who covers pharma for us. She also quotes your, uh, from your interview to The Lancet, where you said that you and your team are following uh, the, the pandemic and the response around the world. So tell us something about a few highlights of that study. Yeah, so this pandemic has played out um, almost, you could have a time machine and you could see if this pandemic has played out like a time machine, right? So the debates we had in February, March in the UK were what were playing out in China in January. In the end, you know, it's first was East China, then it was East Asia, then it was Europe, and then it was North America. Then it started coming into South Asia. Um, then it moved into South America. And now it's moving into Sub-Saharan Africa. We see it moving through. And so in a way, all you would have to do to understand the virus is to look and follow this in real time. What were the debates they had in China? Should we lock down? Shouldn't we? They were not going to lock down over a flu. This is obviously more serious and it required a lot of hospital capacity. Um, in February, we followed the Diamond Princess cruise ship. This was like these people stuck on this cruise ship and the Japanese authorities didn't know what to do with them. Do we take them off the ship? Do we leave them on the ship? Do we put people on the ship? I mean, was, they didn't know enough about the virus. We learned a lot. We learned about asymptomatic transmission. People could feel fine and carry the virus because they tested the people on it. We learned that actually the virus could probably spread through air because people were getting infected across different spaces. We learned about, you know, having to keep healthy people away from sick people and how you actually quarantine. So we kind of have followed this and tried to learn the lessons and bring them in. So here in the UK, we advise, for example, the cabinet office on an advisory group, which is on what is international best practice. So if we look at testing and tracing, which countries have got this right? How are they doing it? So trying to learn. I mean, it's it's real like it's like observational studies in real time. And we have to collect that information and feed it in. So we learn from other countries instead of all making the same mistakes over and over again. So do you find some humility coming into the UK system now? No. No. <laughs> Why do you say so? Because we're still stuck in these, you know, if I think the main thing now people are worried about is can I see my family at Christmas? <laughs> and when can we lift lockdown restrictions, right? And lockdown fatigue. And everyone is angry because they can't go to bars and pubs and they're missing the larger point, which is this is a virus. We have to manage it. We have to suppress it. How do we do it? We're all still debating, is this actually serious or is it like the flu? So first cases went up and people said, oh, it's just cases. Then hospitalizations went up. People said, oh, it's just hospitalizations. Then de deaths start rising. They say like, oh, they're just older people. Then you see deaths in younger people. Oh, those younger people were unhealthy. Okay, then you, do you see what I mean? Like we're stuck in these circular I, debates. I saw that expression, boomer remover. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, I think this is my, I think my main frustration with, I would say, higher income countries has been the lack of humility. They're so used to knowing best. At a certain point, you have to say, what can we learn from other countries? What can South Korea teach us? What can Taiwan teach us? What can we learn from India or Kerala? What can we learn from Thailand? We need to look abroad and realize other countries might know more about infectious disease management than we do. But we're just, as a country, not used to thinking that way. We're used to everything. I mean, especially under Boris Johnson, everything has to be world beating and leading and the best. And we are the we are the best leader. You know, these are the language you're using, which isn't really one around humility. It's one around trying to beat every other country through showing exceptionalism. And I think exceptionalism works in some ways. You might say, oh, everyone's doing it that way. We're going to go this way because we know better. But in a pandemic, that's not the time to do it. If that way is working, you go that way too. <laughs> you don't try to kind of go in a different direction just to be different. You talked about virus being in the air. Now, how serious a threat is that? And how far does it go in the air? So this is something I think that hasn't been emphasized enough. We focused a lot on hand washing around one or two meter distancing. But I think we've seen enough from whether it's gym, fitness studios, whether it's cruise ships, whether it is restaurants, to know that in air conditioning, the air where people are breathing heavily and there a long time, the virus can circulate a longer distance than one or two meters. Meaning if I'm in a bar, very crowded, but I am 
let's say six meters away from someone, if they are infectious and it's crowded and closed, it's likely I will get infected too, as well as all the other people there. If I am outside in a park, same distance, I probably won't be infected. So I think it's ventilation and it's, you know, how, how crowded people are and how much new air do you have coming in. So this is something I think we haven't emphasized enough. I think, you know, now if you go to places, people think, oh, if I'm two meters away, I'm safe. Or I'm saying, yes, if the windows are open or there's filtration systems, but if there's no air and it's just closed off, the virus will travel. We know that because we've seen those places, you know, people getting infected in those scenarios. Yeah. So do you think now that filtration and ventilation are the new masks? Yes. I think that's the next. We're already seeing it. Germany is looking at all of its places for this. So I think this is going to be the newest kind of frontier. Um, and also, as I said, getting people outside more and saying like, so in Scotland right now, you cannot visit other people inside their homes, only outside. And I think actually that's quite good because people are seeing each other, but they have to go outside to do it. I'm doing my meetings on my terrace now. Yes, exactly. It's a little bit better. But uh, these uh, new filters, the HEPA filters, that's a new fashion now. Do those things work? So again, I may be, I'm not the right person probably to talk about them, but I, I don't know the exact specifics, but I think this is a new way of going, which is looking at different filtration systems. I haven't looked at the exact, so I can't comment on the exact one and the exact science, but generally I think many places, are, workplaces are updating their filtration systems to better ones. So many ideas are floating now. It's also a marketing idea. People are now selling hypo, hypochlorous acid foggers. Uh, okay. stuff. I don't know, but... I haven't heard of that. Yeah, there's all kind of new things. I mean, I think in the end, simple things of like, you know, open your windows, get outside, you know, try not to be in closed spaces with others. I mean, if it's your family, of course, it's fine, or your household members. But generally, um, yeah, I mean, it also depends on the local prevalence. So in the summer in Scotland, we had basically no cases. So then if people want to go together all together into a house party, I'm quite relaxed because I think there's not much virus circulating. Right now, the numbers are much higher. So I would say to people, just be a bit more cautious so that it's all about how likely is you to be infected. For me, if I'm in a supermarket and everyone's wearing masks and we're all distanced and I'm just there a short amount of time, I don't, I'm not very likely to be infected. If I'm in a restaurant for a long period of time, I'm more likely to be. Um, if I'm outside in the park, very unlikely to be. So you can just imagine if people who are infectious, you know, are, are walking around, how likely is that you will be infected? And that's the way I kind of think about it in different settings. So what has Scotland done that's better besides the fact that Scotland has you advising them? Oh, well, that's too kind. I mean, so Scotland's quite lucky in that um, when we have a smaller population, so it's 5.5 million people, it's quite crowded at what you call in the central belt, Edinburgh, Glasgow, but the rest of the country is quite remote and distant. So population density is a big factor in having a smaller population. Um, it has a pretty good testing and tracing system. So test results back within the same day, tracing done quite robustly. Um, and we have First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, who leads kind of the response here from Scottish government. And she's been doing press conferences every day for months now. Every day she gets up and she explains, these are the numbers. These are why they're so high. These are the restrictions in place. This is why we have them. And she takes questions from the press and from the public explaining why they're doing what they're doing and the situation. And I think this has helped with public trust and compliance because people are more likely to do something if they understand why they're being asked to do it. So I think this has really helped Scotland a lot is having her leadership and being very clear on, okay, numbers are higher in, let's say, one area of the country. That country, that part of the country is going to have more restrictions. Um, numbers are lower here, so you're coming out of restrictions. So actually explaining to people and treating people like adults, which is why, what, why are we doing what we're doing and explaining the numbers and the clusters and the strategy. Now, let me bring you back to your or what is closest to your heart. Has this pandemic reminded the rest of us that besides your cardiologists and your oncologists and internists, public health professor, uh, doctors also matter? Well, I hope so. If this hasn't taught people, then I don't think anything will. You know, medicine traditionally is about treating. It's about right. treatment. So when someone is ill, you treat them. Public health is preventing someone getting ill in the first place. And so I think that's what this shows, that actually you much would rather keep your numbers low and have nobody ill with this or very few people than to try to treat your way through it. 
And I think if we can keep that approach going into the future, that will be fantastic. And it's a very holistic way. I mean, prevention can be clean water, good food, sanitation, uh, making sure there's parks, green spaces, mental health. It's about how do we make sure people can live healthy and fulfilling lives and prevent them getting ill, prevent them having to go to a doctor or to a hospital. So public health is not some esoteric pursuit. Uh, Esoteric, not very empirical, not very... (laughs) evidence-based pursuit, as a lot of people seem to see. Not at all. Quite the opposite. I mean, actually, if you look, I mean, there are studies done where we try to compare, you know, you know, all kinds of um, going outside of COVID. But for example, studies on green space, you know, does green out of green area around your home affect your your health, air quality? How does that affect your health? I mean, public health is about all the environmental factors, the societal factors that determine our health. They're often more important than, you know, when someone gets ill. So how do we prevent people from getting diabetes rather than, I mean, it's also important to treat people who have it, but how do we prevent them developing it in the first place? So I think hopefully people will see it as an important area and one to invest in um, going into the future because it's much more costly to try to treat people once they're ill than to actually prevent them getting ill, coming back to the economic arguments as well. And before I let you go, uh, let you go to your more important pursuits. Tell us about your time in India, your research project. Uh, what is it that you found? The lessons you learned, and the lessons we should take away from that. And you'll be happy to know that Modi government has now one th- good thing they've done now is to announce that rice will now be fortified. That's Five. excellent. Yeah, so I did this project because I was curious in India over what was causing malnutrition, um, given it's um, such a large problem in India and the links between malnutrition and infectious disease in children. Because actually people think that some, it's very amazing. People think nutrition is here and, and infectious disease is there, but actually they're very closely intertwined, right? Your underlying nutritional status affects your overall health um, towards infectious disease, as well as we're seeing to COVID-19 as well, or to a range of other diseases. Um, And so what I tried to do was actually understand the social conditions and the determinants for actually how could people live uh, more fulfilling lives? Why did people struggle to feed their children? What were the social conditions underlying this? I mean, it's nothing revolutionary what I found. I mean, I think Amartya Sen has been saying it for years, John Drez and others, which is that, you know, you have to get people the right working conditions, the right employment status gender, you know, women coming together. So really it was about that we can't think of these problems as medical. You know, we can't wait till a child shows up in a clinic um, who's dying of diarrhea and needs rehydration. We need to figure out why is that child malnourished in the first place and actually gets down to, you know, largely social questions and unfortunately political questions. I like to stay away from politics, but these are political questions over what do you prioritize um, about equity, about fairness, and about what are the interventions that really work going forward. And these are really about, you know, access to employment, you know, access to gender equality, um, access to education, girls' education is important. So, so much of health is not happening in a bubble. It's actually intertwined with larger, you know, socioeconomic issues. So that was kind of what I explored and my book was about, um, was looking at the social and economic conditions that people can actually be healthy in society. So core public health again. Yeah. So... I agree with you that we'll not go back to 2019, but there'll be some new normalcy that will come up at some point. So when do we see you in India again with a project? Well, I would love to come soon because my grandparents are there and I really miss them. And I actually would love to come see them. So I'm hoping, I mean, I've said to them, maybe after Easter I can come. I'm thinking looking ahead realistically, um, you know, in the East, in, over Easter next summer because they're incredible people and I'm so indebted to them and and they live in in Chennai and I would love just to come see them and spend time with them as well as doing my work, but also just to see them. Um, And I think it is, I mean, what reflects to me is the really hard decisions because they're both old. One is, you know, early nineties, my grandmother's in her late eighties. And so their choices, and they had very active social lives before that. They know lots of people, they always had visitors and they've gone to being very isolated. And I think sometimes you know, is the isolation worse for them? But then, of course, they don't want to catch COVID because they know COVID for them is would be incredibly serious. And it just shows why we have to keep suppressing this virus so people like that can live fulfilling lives and healthy lives. Because, yes, they might be 90, but they are incredible people. They've done a lot. They've, you know, raised me. They've done lots of things with their lives. And to think that they're somehow not as worth of social engagement as others is not right. They have actually more 
a more active social life than I do. So if anything, I want them to get back to that as soon as they I'm can. So they'll be watching when we uh, when we broadcast it. But do you have a project, research project in mind for India now? Well, not for India specifically. I'm doing um, my large, I'm writing a book now, which is on COVID-19 unfolding, where I go through different parts of the world. Um, each chapter is on a different region and right. talk about how the pandemic evolved there and how it played into its history because each country responded based on its own kind of historical engagement with infectious diseases. So India is part of that as one of the chapters. So that's kind of my large project this year. We look forward to it, Professor Devi Shridhar. Thank you very much. You've, you've been so generous with your time and you've been so patient. Also. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to do it. And I look forward to being in touch. Thank you very much. Okay, bye.